Hello, everybody. Hi, and welcome tonight um, to our Simply Rhino um, introduction to Grasshopper 3D and uh, Grasshopper training. So I'm Steph from Simply Rhino, and with me on screen at the moment, you should also be able to see Paul and Arthur. Um, Hello. So, hi guys. So, if quick little bit of housekeeping first of all. Um, you're on your screen, those of you that are here as an attendee, um, you'll see that there is a question panel um, which you can open up and you can type your questions into that for us and send them over. Please do that throughout the um, webinar and we will answer as many as we can live after Arthur's presentation and any that we don't get to live, we will um, email you, follow up with afterwards. Um, we are recording tonight's session. So a copy of that will be available to all the attendees and we will automatically send that through to you should you wish to use it as a reference afterwards. Um, and so, yeah, so we're Simply Rhino. We, um, we do Rhino sales, training and support. Um, so here for all your Rhino needs. Um, Paul works with me in the UK and Arthur also works with us, also based here in the UK. Um, and we also have uh, Kathy, who's in uh, in Simply Rhino South Africa, who is was here a minute ago, but simply got a connection problem. But Kathy will hopefully reappear at some point. Um, at the end of Arthur's presentation, we're going to do a live Q and A. So we'll be back on at that. Um, but in the meantime, Paul and I will disappear once we hand over to Arthur. Um, I think that's it. So hopefully. Yep. Um, everyone is good. I can just see in the questions, somebody's just put, is there audio, is my system playing up? If you can't hear anything, then you'll notice in the chat bar that there's a little piece that I've put about if you have any sound issues. The first thing you should do if you've got anything about that, if you're not hearing the audio properly, then um, check your volume on your computer speakers, um, check your device output, um, and just check that your audio is play is not, isn't playing for a different output. Um, I can hear from other people that they can see and hear as well. So it's probably something sort of more isolated with you. So hopefully you can um, sort that out, but send me another message if you can't, and I can try and message you back with a, an idea. Um, okay, so I've spoken enough. I'm gonna ha make Arthur the presenter now. And Arthur um, is gonna talk to us about Grasshopper and our Grasshopper courses. Okay, so see you Arthur, all at the end. <laughs> and over to you, and we'll yeah, and we'll see everybody at the end. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Over so, to you, Arthur. Yeah, fantastic. So, uh, can you see my monitor one? As in, can you see lots of windows saying "Simply Rhino" everywhere? What yes, can you see we can. Minute? You can. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a good sign. Okay. Cool. Well, I'm super happy to to be here uh, and 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 just kickstart our classes. It's been about uh, ten years that I've had the opportunity to uh, to teach with Simply Rhino, and and we were just talking about the amazing uh, the diversity of, of of people that we had the chance to teach from, uh, you know, Heatherwick Studios, Ahadid, and Foster and Partners, but also, uh, you know. Uh, uh, people like uh, McLaren Racing and Lacoste and and so it's been a, a broad range of uh, professions that are interested in parametric design, uh, even Cadbury chocolate, <laughs> which is a pretty amazing thing to 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 be to be kind of. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I just, I guess it's important for me to to first kind of explain a little bit like how how the classes are working because they've evolved quite a bit since uh, a few uh, a few years. And they are first of all all online, which opens up the entire world for you, uh, as in anyone can attend them. There is level one and there is level two. Uh, we are about uh, three teachers to teach them, um, you know, and basically they're around, uh, we have about seven sessions, they're about three three hours each. Um, and although the class is pretty uh, uh, sort of defined by a, a calendar, a schedule, which I'm, I'm, I'm hope you, I hope you, I don't know if you had a chance to see it, uh, you know different parts different um which which you know i'll cover i'll cover with you we we really have a lot of fun and therefore we explore a lot of things and people give a lot of uh, feedback along the way uh which which means that we adapt to everyone's needs really and in three hours you can do a lot 
And, and it, why is it so long? Because Grasshopper is a relatively new way of thinking. And I've had the chance to, to practice it uh, as an architect, a uh, designer, as a fabricator. And I just want to show you during this presentation, we have about uh, 50 minutes together. Uh, so I just want to see you, um, you know, and, and then, uh, sorry, I, I cannot see you, but I, I can share with you the entire kind of broad range of how we've applied the tool. Um, and so, <clears throat> I'm, I'm probably going to just give you a quick rundown of, of the classes, uh, which, which might be the, the sort of more practical things. And then what I'm going to do is show you our work. And then finally, I might um, show you a little bit Grasshopper itself, uh, which is, you know, a plugin to Rhino. I don't know. I, I cannot obviously ask the audience if, you, if you've used it. I think I can see the chat a little bit. I, I hope I can see some of what's going on out there. But uh, I trust you're listening and that this will be uh, interesting for you. Um, so uh, level one is is obviously for open to all beginners, like complete beginners. Um, and what we do is we go through the interface. The interface of Grasshopper is something that comes up, um, you know, next to your. This is Rhino, for example. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Rhino. Uh, you don't have to be familiar with Rhino to to join our classes. Uh, but here is is the Rhino interface, and then there's a little Grasshopper sign here that you click, and then it opens this interface here on the left. This interface here is the, we call it the canvas. It's got all these like uh, different uh, components. The components come with uh, sliders and with things like this. These are graph mappers. These are ways to like use mathematics to change geometry. Uh, I'll show you what this is. This is a little surprise at the end of the presentation. I don't want to ruin it, uh, but um, this has been a, a very personal project that I've never shown ever. <laughs> and so I'll explain this a little bit at the end of the presentation. But basically, we go through the interface on, on, on the first um, uh, week of the seven weeks. Then we go through data structure, so how Grasshopper organizes data. Uh, then we go through uh, surface paneling, et cetera, et cetera. It's been absolutely fantastic to see like the different things that people have done using, um, you know, bridge-like structures, towers-like structures, but also just abstract geometry. We go through very... Um, very kind of scale-less approach to this in a sense that I want you and my colleagues want you to learn um, what is parametric design and, and, and what are data structures and ways to use this, this tool. Um, level two is, is a little bit more advanced in that we do things like this, <laughs> which is like complex data uh, tree structures, complex components on surfaces, meshes, and we look at physics simulation like kangaroo, weaver bird, um, and so this allows us to go a little bit more in detail into things that are slightly more heavy in memory and so on. All these plugins might not mean much, which is why I'm really keen to show you um, how it's being applied in our in our practice and and how um you know how all this is kind of useful for 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 architects for designers and i know i've got 15 minutes so i'll, I'll take full advantage of that and uh, and please do interrupt me anyone if uh, <laughs> if 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 everything is not okay uh basically um why i start with this because first and foremost I, i'm sure you know grasshopper rhino is a community um more than a software it's a community of people that kind of help each other that uh, share uh, knowledge. And, and I think that's why I love doing this. Uh, that's the reason 10 years after I still teach um, because I feel like I learn as much as I teach and, and that it's allowed me to kind of share a journey with many, many people. And, and I think that we all feel this, that this is beyond just a class. It's, it's actually kind of creating things together. Um, and, and so that's why it's so much fun. And I hope you'll you'll have you'll you'll have, you'll get to experience that fun. So these are some of the projects we worked on uh, for Burning Man, the event in the USA, which is pretty much also that in a sort of uh, physical way. Um, and I'll, I'll take you through that. This is some of the the building that we've worked on. Um, you know, a, a very large grid shell of about 60 meters wide and uh, 20 meters high uh, in the desert, which uh, was an absolutely uh, amazing journey uh, to to construct. And you can see Grasshopper in our in our office. This is our office in in East London, um, actually next to uh, Simply Rhino and next to FabPub, which is FabPub is the fabrication studio that we have here. So you can see that uh, really Grasshopper is not uh, disassociated with physical things. Uh, in fact, it's very much linked. And I'm going to show you how we linked it with 3D printing, with laser cutting, uh, to work at all scales. And, and that's really important because. Um, Often we see these as completely abstract things and we attend a class where things can stay very, very um, on the, the sort of um, 
how can I say, digital level. And and actually, Grasshopper has strangely enough like linked us with with physical things, with prototyping, with making, with um, and so I, you know I, I think it's important to see this ent this entire um, uh, Grasshopper and uh, environment as 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 a sort of uh, a new method of practicing. Uh, a new method of, of linking our files with wider parameters. So it's called parametric design uh, because, I mean, you're seeing here a, a video of our last uh, class, uh, 10 years teaching anniversary, um, with, with a really uh, kind of a happy bunch. Um, and basically, it's showing a little bit um, all of the stuff that we're doing, uh, you know, un obviously understanding surface divisions, understanding what's the the parameters behind um, a NURBS geometry, a Bezier spline. I, we take it through the, the very, very essential um, aspects of, of what is geometry, you know, what, why was Bezier curves even invented? Uh, what is the domain of a curve? What is the domain of a surface? Um, and and I, I think like going through the really core principles of, of these, uh, not just help us to design better, I think, because we design with an, we, with an understanding of the tool, but um, it also allows us to, to dive a little bit deeper and maybe uh, create things that are unexpected. Um, when you start playing with, with Grasshopper, as you can see, you start with surfaces, you import them from Rhino, uh, you start exploring their property, you use their property to then create uh, geometries. You can see here uh, um, <laughs> explaining what uh, the UV space is. Um, I think a lot of people might kind of uh, know Grasshopper but don't know the behind the scene, which is essential to actually learn uh, you know, how to use the tool. You know, in a way that you're not a, a victim of the tool, but that you're actually a, a sort of active uh, <laughs> uh, contributor of the tool, to, of the tool, so that your pro that your work has a certain depth to it. I, I, I'm sure I, I don't want to play it too long because I'm sure you, you'll probably get a headache from seeing an accelerated video. But it's just to give you a spirit, a spirit of the of the class. And these are some of the stuff that we did in the last class. Uh, this is level two. For example, just to show you uh, from, I don't know, simulating spaghettis uh, to creating some kind of coral, uh, a sort of origami tower, some termite mounds, and, and a donut made of waves. Uh, I, I say this in a funny manner because, in a way, creativity is, is boundless. And, and so, really, why is it important to simulate spaghetti? Because it's the same tool that allows us to create uh, a simulation of uh, physical uh, properties like, for example, a roof that is uh, being form found or uh, a tent, you know, all these is the same as simulating spaghetti. It's just much co more complex to simulate spaghetti. Same with origamis or, or termite mount. The, the complexity that you learn to build up will then be applicable to other stuff. But I'd rather not teach you how to make a stadium from someone else kind of thing, because I feel like then we're just not seeing how you can actually create new things rather than copying, you know, and I, I think that's, uh, um, that's really important. Then it opens up your, your, your mind, in a way, to the possibilities. All right, so um, Simply Rhino, uh, you know, I've had the, the chance to have a certain freedom uh, to also practice and, and create a, an architectural practice and a fabrication space, and, and why it's important, because I don't think a teacher uh, can necessarily teach as well as he can if he doesn't practice as well. Um, and 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 so therefore, um, the, the 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 all the tools that I'm going to show you, all the all the project I'm going to show you have are using different tools, and and I, and I think it's it's important that I show you how it's being used. So I'll tell you every plugin that's been used, and 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 I'll explain how it was useful. So this is the team. Um, uh, there is uh, Carmen here as well that you you'll probably know, and 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 a few people that join the the classes once in a while to help. Um, we're very much uh, about. Uh, teamwork and and so uh, it won't just be uh, one person that you'll you'll come across and and these are some of the kind of values that uh, permeate in the work you know a holistic approach to design being the makers of our own project and creating architecture and design that grows from parameters um, understanding and working with machines empowering makers and sharing design ideas around the world so these are the values that allowed us to create uh, some of these projects. This is projects that we did at Burning Man with the students, um, and all of them use them Grasshopper. Um, you can see, for example, patterns uh, that are laser cut on, on 
uh, on wood or, or fractal, recursive fractal using uh, hoop snake, or uh, we have a kind of crazy tower using kangaroo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now we take it sometimes much further and we even create uh, machines uh, from, from the tool. This is using Firefly, which is a way to link uh, Grasshopper to uh, you know, our things like Arduino. So for example, this was a kind of homemade machine. The idea was to sort of speculate on, on what could be a giant crane 3D printer. Uh, this is in the office. And so it's a real joy that Grasshopper is opening up interfaces like phone interfaces. So um, as a visual programming tool, you can really push uh, the technique. I think the Eiffel Tower is parametric design. Uh, <laughs> you can see that it's a module that changes uh, parametrically over its own height. I especially like it because it was meant to be temporary and, and remained, and also because I'm French. I don't know if you heard my accent. Um, but I really, really enjoyed um, the, the sort of simplicity of the design. And, and this is something that comes back. The fact that you use Grasshopper doesn't mean that you're going to do complex stuff. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's too complex and therefore it's too hard to understand. On the contrary, by understanding the mathematics behind something, you're actually kind of able to build complexity from simple rules. And, 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 and so you have access to the code that is behind a geometry as opposed to modeling that geometry. So these are some of the projects that we, uh, we use Grasshopper uh, with, and, and it ranges from this is a flat, for example, uh, or this is a whole building. Um, and I, I say designing systems, not forms, because really the, the thinking behind Grasshopper is that this is one version of many, many parametric version that we can do. And therefore, uh, you know, it's not just for creativity, but also clients feel that what you're doing is not having one version of something, but that you have an infinity of possibility that you can adapt and so on and so forth. So these are some of the projects we've worked on um, using, this is for example, having a facade that we can unfold into some straight lines. So the straight lines are steam bent. So this is simulated using kangaroo, for example, which is taught at level two. Uh, this is a tower we're doing in Bali. Um, it's actually timber uh, um, uh, towers, which we, we use from a reclaimed, uh, this is a, a bridge um, and we're taking the, the wood and then we're applying uh, the geometry to that. This is using graph mappers, uh, which is level one. Um, and, uh, and this is the sand wave um, that we did. This is using intra lattice. Uh, which helps us on Grasshopper create complex lattices that we can then um, give a, with something like Dendro, which is a plugin that gives its thickness, uh, allowed us to link it with Caramba. Sorry, I'm going to say a lot of those software because they're all plugins of Grasshopper. And so basically you, you fill the line, you, you ask for Caramba for the, uh, the thickness of every element and it outputs the kilonewtons. Then the kilonewtons give us a, a kind of idea of uh, what sort of thickness the, the material can take. So, as I mentioned, there are so many plugins, and that's, I think, what is really, really beautiful from, from uh, simulation of sunlight uh, to uh, that we actually used. Uh, the, one of our clients was a, a lawyer who needed to know the sunlight exactly at a certain day. We even had a de detective, uh, a policeman that came to our classes looking for, uh, <laughs> like, if the blood arrived in a certain spot, where, where, where did it come from? Um, so we've had a really kind of amazing breadth of, uh, of people coming through our classes because I think um, it's basically coding, really. So um, what's parametric design? Uh, this is you know, my, my graduation project. It, it was basically using uh, another tool, not Grasshopper. It was before Grasshopper uh, called Generative Components. Um, the, <laughs> the, the person who, uh, who created it, uh, Robert H, actually uh, came to our class because he realized Grasshopper uh, was really um, the, the future, I think, <laughs> to be honest. I don't know if this is recorded. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But, uh, but basically, this was a component that was linked to the sun. Um, and then the component was then applied to the to the surface. And this was the very early days. So when I graduated and I, I went straight to work on a biodome, uh, which used a simple rule. So this is a big uh, dome that actually has what we call geodesic curve, which is the shortest distance between two points on a surface. And so you see Grasshopper helped kind of create a pattern that reacted to the surface itself. So you can see here, I'm shifting the, uh, the list and then you can see the density increase where it's needed. What was great about that is that the cells uh, could be extracted. So we could extract cells 
create like different ETF cushions on top of the structure, analyze the data, and create a relatively kind of complex uh, dome based on rules. Um, this is Kangaroo. So this is simulation of origamis, uh, which we do in level two. We actually did the exact same thing in level two here uh, in the last session. And this basically allows you to kind of see how an origami would fold. Um, and, and, and therefore, it's a pattern that sort of influences the three-dimensional geometry, which I find really, really fantastic, actually. Um, and so when you work parametrically, you start doing things like this. This is a matrix of versions, because you're basically working on a system and not one single form, um, doing a kind of um, array of, of, of uh, geometries help us understand like the diversity of what you're working on. So you see, it's really a method, not just a tool. So uh, when we teach, we teach you the method, not just not just the tool. These are some of the the projects that we could do, you know, by sending the files and linking them to the laser cutter. Laser cutter. Same with this project, the wooden wave. We had a, a sort of a, a technique to to cut the the, the surface and therefore um, create these amazing uh, wave-like geometry, and then build up that complexity through openings, uh, which we could then vary and laser cut as well. So, just to show you a, a few uh, images of that project. So uh, I've worked on a plugin. Everyone who starts working on Grasshopper starts developing plugins, and this is called Silkworm. And Silkworm is a way to send um, values to a 3D printer, uh, which is really, really fantastic because uh, normally in 3D printing, you're constrained to uh, slicing. And this allows you to kind of send polylines and transform them into G-code, which, um, which is really kind of direct dialogue with the machine. And so you can create uh, things that are a little bit more unexpected. Um, and, and so therefore, We've used it, and it continue. This is live at the moment in London. If you're in London, uh, I suppose maybe not, but in Fortnum and Mason, we built this gigantic structure uh, using Silkworm um, and and Grasshopper, of course, to create the continuity. You can see here the uh, the files that we send to our 3D printer are directly linked to our uh, Grasshopper um, projects, and basically using the ribs uh, that make the, the pieces a bit stronger were tested in Grasshopper. Everything that was varied parametrically to do that. Um, I haven't had a chance to show that project, so you're the first one to see it, and even better, this is a project we're doing at the uh, Design Museum very soon, about in, I think it, we're installing it in two weeks, and it's a modular approach to, to design. One of the things that, that, that is very important for us is the circular the circularity. So the fact that we can crush these, these bioplastics and then bring them back and print again. Um, so we, we've been doing a lot of research on bioplastics and modularity. So this is intralattice. This was for Louis Vuitton. We used the, uh, the monogram of, of Louis Vuitton and, and did a three-dimensional version of it. Um, and so just trying to kind of create things that we can apply into different contexts. This is my, my home, uh, which we're working on at the moment. And, and this allowed us to create a modular panels using Silkworm and, a, and a, a tool called Parakeet. Parakeet is a, is a plugin that allows you to do uh, patterns and lattices. Uh, and so we created this. And then uh, hopefully we, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be able to kind of show uh, how even homeware could be done using uh, 3D printing. Uh, this is a ring, so that's the, the, what I was showing you. That's the special surprise. This is my engagement uh, ring with my wife that we uh, uh, that you know I, I worked on, and then I 3D printed using uh, wax and a lost wax uh, technique. Um, and 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 that's the file that I was showing you. So <laughs> I don't know if you can recognize uh, using sine curves to create these uh, interwoven uh, elements. Um, and these are the, the bio bricks of, of COS. So this is a project we did uh, uh, for COS using 700 of these, what we call bio bricks. And basically these are uh, truss-like uh, elements that could hold a massive weight, which I, I think is really uh, kind of nice because it, it shows how very light elements can, can take quite a lot of weight if we think of them parametrically. So for example, those red lines, are um, the forces with a breaking point of, of Karamba. So Karamba is the plugin, the structural plugin of Grasshopper, and, and we would put these very regular arrays, and Karamba would reveal the breaking points. And I think that's really nice because it means we can work very, very precisely on the elements that would break rather than the entire thing. So it allows us to be really, really specific in the use of material and, and minimizing waste. Um, and so that was Conifera, and that was the sand waves. Uh, which we did in, in Saudi Arabia with Chris Precht. 
And this was, we were attempting to use uh, SEND uh, to create uh, urban infrastructure. Um, and so we, we linked it to, uh, to, to SEND printing, which is a really uh, kind of interesting uh, technique. And basically you can see the module that we have uh, are, are actually um, um, kind of assembled together to form these, uh, uh, these structures. So I can't really not speak about Burning Man, and I, I you know, it's been 21 minutes, so uh, I think it, it's quite nice to uh, to show you that. I hope everything is okay. I, I don't know if I can see the the chat. Uh, um, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, Burning Man is a place where you know we can have a certain creativity and freedom. So really, that was a sort of extension of the workshop. Uh, <laughs> this was actually something that came from Grasshopper Level One. It's when I teach tangents, uh, and in fact, since it's been 22 minutes, I can actually show you what I mean by that. Uh, let me take it live to you and show you how, from a, a class, we came to do an entire structure. Um, so this is always kind of interesting when, I hope you can see my grasshopper. Uh, again, stop me if you don't. This is a curve, a Bezier spline um, that I can bring into grasshopper here. And I can actually kind of divide it into several points. Here we go. And this gives me point, tangent, and parameters, right? So we get the properties of the curve from grasshopper. And then we can add sliders, which allows us to kind of uh, add more density or not parametrically. And so after that, if I do a line, a line, what we call a line by start, direction, and length, and I go points, direction, etc., and I, I can put a different length here. Here we go, right? You can start seeing what I mean. You have these beautiful curves that are being drawn, and that allows to uh, actually visualize the curvature of space, right? Because in this case, the, the, the lines that you're seeing here are actually the slope of the curve. So you get a sort of uh, a different vision of what curvature can be. And, and so taking this uh, and then rotating it um, helped create this, this, this piece called Tangential Dream. Um, and so uh, extracting information from Grasshopper, we extracted it onto a matrix of values, which was then kind of cut and helped us create this, this piece. Uh, people would write their dreams on it, hence the use of tangent in a poetic way, which then led to uh, actually building what, what's called the, the Temple of Burning Man. So Burning Man um, basically has people that uh, are attending a city for a week. Um, and at the time when I, when I first went there, I was working on the, uh, a bit of a mad project for Virgin Galactic. This was uh, um, for the, the astronauts of uh, Virgin Galactic. And basically this is using um, uh, Hoopsnake or Anemone. These are recursive tools that allow you to uh, recurse, which is to take something and then apply a transformer to that uh, element and then apply it again and apply it again. And, and that's why things seem to be growing, right? And you can see it's growing in space whilst then being analyzed with the sun, the sunlight. And so the idea of this project was to have uh, the sunlight come through in the winter and be diffused in the summer. And so that project, uh, which was kind of um, in the middle of another desert um, for the galactic uh, <laughs> uh, curious uh, people, uh, led to Galaxia, which was the Temple of Burning Man 2018. Uh, which was a sort of really important project for us, uh, especially because it was just uh, so hard <laughs> to make it and so difficult, but also just extremely rewarding in terms of uh, the, the human experience. Um, so this is Galaxia, and you can see that people are putting lots of different things. This is very granular. Uh, granular is a term that my engineer, uh, James Soli, talked about because it's the essence of a structure. It's like, you, there's no columns, everything is structural, so everything is working. Um, and so basically, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pure structure in a way, like the, the, like the Eiffel Tower, which I'm so inspired by. And so this is the petals. They were kind of created separately, and then a polar array was applied in order to create a, something that can be reproduced. And symmetry is extremely important when, when building um, you know, uh, in the desert for people to learn, especially because it was all volunteers that were uh, there and uh, uh, working uh, like crazy in the heat. And, um, and basically, this is um, the, what we call the petals. And then we used off-the-shelf uh, pieces, which I think was interesting because grasshopper is often um, you create a geometry and then you, you extract that for fabrication. But in, in this case, we used off-the-shelf pieces and then brought them in 
in order to uh, create a file that had off-the-shelf pieces. I don't know if, if that's kind of clear, but it's really important because, for example, here our simulation, instead of saying use that size, it's more we have four by four inches and two by four inches timber. Where to place them, right? As opposed to extract information and then force the material to be a certain way. So I think that what's really interesting is you can see the Newtons, right? All the Newtons are, are kind of uh, expressed. And then our engineer said, well, a screw can take about 1.8 Newton. So then I kind of divide the, the Newtons of the, of the structure uh, with a little buffer by the capacity of the screw. And then you'll get, your, uh, you'll get the size of your plates. And so uh, really, I mean, they trust the tools, right? Because to tell that, uh, to tell someone to do tools based on uh, you know, forces is, 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 is quite a, a risky uh, <laughs> way to do things. So these are the, the volunteers assembling uh, the volumes together. Um, and then all these volumes were forming a matrix of values that, that people could kind of recognize like, oh, done, done, done. This was literally a, pl a plan of the structure. And what's good is we could extract information for Rhino. And we created this with, uh, with Rhino, with video capture, uh, with the turntable. Uh, and so we used the information from Grasshopper, brought it into Rhino, and then created this animation that we could share with all of our uh, team, which, which was really nice. So you can see the, the crane, the, the assembly process. And so, of course, creating Grasshopper files is, 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 doesn't remove from the, the logistics of things, uh, which I think was really important. So from the 1D to the 2D to the 3D uh, to the 4D, it sort of summarizes a little bit our, our path in terms of using origami and learning from origamis and so on. Um, and this is some of the drawings we've extracted, the connection details that we needed, and we shared that with, with the team before we opened up the, the project. Um, and so it was a really beautiful, deep uh, experience, which, which then um, you know, was, was shared with the community. I got, I got married there. I showed you my engagement ring. Now I'm showing you my wedding. You, so you'll know everything about me. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this was Galaxia that we uh, then uh, burnt in a, in a ritual manner. Uh, we had about 70,000 people uh, quiet, uh, quietly kind of seeing this project um, disappear with all the content that they've placed um, before we could recycle it and, uh, and, and, and get rid of the, um, the ashes that were then mixed with some kind of decomposed granite that was used uh, for, the, for the next year, basically. Um, and so we were going to go, uh, but obviously COVID happened. We were going to build this structure. This structure is called Catharsis. Um, and the idea was to create a project that we would disassemble and reassemble in London uh, to share with the community. It just strangely looked like a, like a COVID virus, but uh, it's actually a fractal. Uh, we remodeled it using Parakeet, the plugin, um, and then we are now exploring different versions of that project, which we hope to still build this summer. And you're more than welcome to contact me uh, to come and build it as the extension of level two, and <laughs> it might be our level three. Um, and so this is in the Somerset House, uh, the, the Catharsis project. And that is the project we're building in, uh, in Bali, in Indonesia. It's a, it's a slight variation of this. And you can recognize maybe uh, this is, for example, called cross-referencing on Grasshopper. Um, so you'll always recognize some some uh, <laughs> grasshopper items uh, in in all the work because everything has been done using grasshopper and 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 I hope you'll you'll come and learn it. So don't, don't hesitate to contact us. I think it it'll be absolutely fantastic to uh, to have you in our next sessions. They're very soon. I think they're in November, uh, and there's plenty of places left uh, which we really, really hope that you'll take part of. Um, I think I covered everything. It's been 40 minutes, uh, third something like 40 minutes. I think. <laughs> Don't know if I should, I should stop or show you more. What's the spirit? Well, I don't know. Do you, how much more would you like to show us after? And we have a few. Um, we have a few sort of housekeeping questions that have come in. Okay. Um, so maybe I can just uh, answer those quickly live um, that people have asked. Um, so after you just mentioned the uh, the upcoming courses, um, yeah. so we have. Uh, Grasshopper Level 1, the next course starts on um, November the 5th. Um, that's seven sessions delivered on uh, Friday afternoons. So that's uh, seven lots of three hours. And then the next uh, Level 2 um, with Arthur is on, no, starts on November the 3rd. Um, and that's seven times uh, Wednesday evenings. So, and somebody asked, um, uh, Lisa, I think, asked about whether our classes were delivered live, and the answer is yes. 
the courses are all delivered live. Um, they are also, the sessions are also recorded and the link for those are then shared just privately with the people that attend that particular course so that they can um, go back and reference them um, should they want to. Um, the other thing to point out, somebody asked about uh, uh, class sort of size. Um, I don't know if Paul wants to say something about this, but basically we limit yep. our class sizes um, quite strictly um, to eight attendees. Um, I don't know if Paul, do you want to say anything more about yeah, that? Yeah, I'll just say that um, through, I, I guess it's many years of class tuition, not just grasshopper classes, but rhino classes at different levels for different industries, we've found that the only practical way forward is to deliver this to small groups. Once it turns into large groups of, you know, 12 plus, you know, even there's, there's grasshopper classes available that would have over 20 people in one class. Um, and at that point, we just find it turns into a lecture. You know, there's there's little room for discussion between the trainees and the trainer, you know, in, and Arthur. Uh, it, it just becomes an obstacle at that point. So we strictly limit the class sizes to eight people. Um, it's, it's the only way it can work in, in a live environment because there's a lot of uh, discussion as well as, as sharing of knowledge from Arthur to the group. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to make that clear. Cool, thanks. Um, so that's the, I've got some more, I think we have a couple more questions coming through. Um, so Paul, you can see the questions there also. Um, are the class, is the course from Said, is the course GH1 and 2 offered by Simply Run the same as the classes offered by McNeil? No, they're not. Um, the classes that we offer are uh, designed by Arthur, who, you know, as a practitioner of Grasshopper, rather than a sort of developer of Grasshopper, I think you'll find that the the examples and the way that it's taught, I mean, perhaps Arthur, you could mention something about this, about how yeah. the, the class, how the courses were designed. Um, yeah. I don't think you'd necessarily be familiar with how the McNeil classes are structured necessarily, but they, they I know they're different anyway. Um, I, I attended a, a McNeil uh, class uh, on Grasshopper as well and on programming and, and so on. And um, I think by having a, a practitioner, exactly what you said, like by having practitioners, people that experience the, 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 the issues of any users is having, I mean, the way we met with, with Paul is because I kept on asking questions on the forum. And <laughs> so I was a, yeah. a, a struggling beginner. And, uh, and so, and I guess, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I saw that there was a community. And so I, I kept on asking. So you'll probably see uh, my name and my face on, on the forum asking the, 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 the weirdest questions. Um, but I, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think at some point people were like, uh, what's going on? Who's that guy? Wait. Uh, but actually, strangely enough, my struggles then help other people because they could see the answers to those struggles. And and, and it kept, just kept on going, you know, and and, it, and I still ask questions and I still, and, and I, I think th those struggles mean I can relate to, to beginners uh, very much. So I've never been a programmer or I just, I just come from a, you know, a sort of a background of just learning architecture. And, and so it, was, it wasn't it was like I was especially kind of a, a coder or anything as such. So I think that might make the class a bit more relatable. Sure. Uh, and of course, it's important that the class is taught by somebody that hasn't just uh, sort of experienced Grasshopper, that they have applied Grasshopper in many different fields and in and, and as many industries as possible. And so, uh, you know, that's an essential part of any class on these types of technical subjects. So, uh, and Arthur certainly has that in spades. So, uh, um, yeah. Um, what else is it? We, we should, Steph, put the people, there's some questions about, you know, the dates and the costs and these things. All of that information is on our website. So we can just give you the links to the Grasshopper Level 1 page and the Grasshopper Level 2 page. It gives you the links to the full PDFs that Arthur's that you're looking at on the screen now. So you can look at those documents. It gives you the dates for the current classes, the next dates, it gives you the prices. There are student, there are students get discounts on the classes. Um, and bear in mind that you 
I think one of the other differences between our classes and many of the other classes is that um, you get access live, but you also get access to the recording. So um, it's not a kind of a one-off thing. Um, you get to ask the questions within the live sessions and then you get to access the recordings for, I believe, a year um, following the class. Um, so there's, there's that difference too. So I so, put the um, link for Grasshopper Level 1 and Grasshopper Level 2 into the chat. Oh, great. Um, and also, um, we'll be following up with everybody as well and sending them the links to those. Um, if you go to those links, you can download the PDFs that Arthur's showing on his screen from there as well. So they're downloadable PDFs as well as full screen viewings on those pages. Hmm. I, I should also mention that if you, we have quite a lot of people coming on the classes now since COVID time particularly from all around the world. So, I mean, we've had attendees from, well, from, from many different countries now. Um, one of the things, just a small point about that is that there's no VAT due on those bookings. So if you look at the prices and where it says plus VAT, that won't apply to you if you're not in the UK. Okay. Um, I have a question for you, Arthur. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's more of a sort of general question. I think this is sort of beyond grasshopper question. <laughs> Uh, Anton has asked, just as, um, you know, if someone's considering that they've sort of moved on with Grasshopper, let's say, and they're looking at uh, plugin development and, you know, sort of development platforms that, that are useful to Rhino, would you suggest that, some, that someone looks at Python or at C Sharp? I mean, they're the two options that, uh, that Anton's mentioned. So yeah. would you have a, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it really depends on a bit. I, I would need to speak to you a little bit more because uh, obviously it depends on what you want to do and so on. But I, I've used C Sharp for Silkworm and I think it's uh, a little better because it gives you, you know, there is what we call the Rhino common. Uh, in fact, you yeah. can still see my screen? Yes. Ah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So Rhino Common is, um, is something that is available for everyone. Uh, it's the kind of developers, uh, I see if I can find it. Uh, you see the, the Rhino Common with Sika. What is Rhino Common and so on? It's very accessible with C Sharp. Um, and so you'll find that you'll, uh, you, you'll have the ability to kind of, um, uh, I, I'll see if I can actually find the, uh, the Rhino Common SDK straight up for you. Uh, and I, I might just show you the difference as well on, on um, on, on oh here we go so this is the namespace and i'm just going to show you how to use it quickly i mean i guess we have a bit of time right yes you do yeah fantastic yeah. okay so when you're when you're programming you're going to the math uh space here and you have the c sharp and you have the uh the, well you see i don't even have the python python is is actually a, a plugin that you download from uh so it's not it's not kind of the the, the actual what we call the uh, the, um, the interface the 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 programming interface um, is not actually within Grasshopper, so whereas the C sharp is, and and what we can do is actually access things, uh, which is you know um, a little bit more uh, straightforward to some extent. That I can put, for example, uh, I don't know the curve, uh, the curve that I was just doing. Then I go X is a curve here, like this, and then if I click on the the C sharp and I go uh, X dot, it will give me everything that a curve can do. You see, um, and and that is something that you can find here. Rhino.geometry.curve, for example, um, gives you all the kind of methods that can be applied to curves. So there is a really straightforward relationship between uh, what it is that you do within this user interface and the the methods that can be used in the Rhino common. In other words, if you were to use Python, you'd have to uh reinvent a little bit of all that you'll have to access the rhino common through a special command etc so it's not as straightforward it's fair to, to to know that grasshopper was done on c sharp so it was invented on c sharp so a lot of the stuff that you'll see uh you know uh, i'll give you a little fun fun fact uh there is this uh plugin the sorry this uh forum called stack overflow um which is where i was asking my question for uh for programming and uh, there's a there's a funny uh, there's a funny thing which is um, actually strangely enough that's also where David Rutten is asking his questions. Uh, so uh, not putting him on the spot, but 
you can see that he's asking his own question on C Sharp uh, mostly. Um, and so if the creator of Grasshopper himself is using C Sharp and, but the thing is, that's the thing I'm not quite sure is, is are you moving on from Grasshopper or are you programming within Grasshopper? It all depends, right? Because Python is, is one of those cool um, uh, programming language that are a little bit more human. Uh, you know, th there's like a scale in programming. There is like machine on one side and human on the other side. And like, uh, as uh, you know, obviously English is very human, but if I tell you zero one zero zero, it's more machine. And there's a lot of kind of different uh, range between machine and human. And and C sharp is 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 quite good on the human scale, but Python is obviously uh, better. Uh, because you don't need to do things like declare variables and so on. But uh, but to be honest, I, 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 in the pros of using C Sharp, it's also very, very similar to a, a tool called processing or Java, you know, stuff like that. So if you learn mm -hmm. C Sharp, um, you'll also have this bridge to do things like Java and processing, which, which I think are very important uh, these days. Anyways, it's a long-winded uh, answer, but I hope it helps. No, good answer, good answer, okay. Um... If, if uh, I might ask uh, Anton for more on his particular background, so we can answer that more yeah. uh, directly. But that's that's good. Thanks, Arthur. Um, Arthur, how long have you been using Grasshopper? Well, um, I think uh, I'm just going to laugh because I'll see my first question on Grasshopper 3D.com. Oh, yeah. We'll um, see what the question is. Yeah, <laughs> my very first question. Yeah, that's that's actually a good a good uh, a good test for me. Uh, to be honest, I so I graduated from the Architectural Association in ooh, um, in uh, 2008. Uh, I met Paul, I think, in in 2010, maybe something like that. Um, and basically, uh, so it's been yeah, 10 years. It, it wasn't it 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 sort of was released in 2000. Um, Eight grasshopper. So I think I, I. Anyways, I think I don't know what's going on, but I cannot see my first question. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. That, that's a, that, that's a, that's good. Uh, 2010. Yeah. So it yeah, this is be, the yeah. old grasshopper support forum we're looking yes, at here. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's not no longer basically. I, I don't want to confuse you because this is the grasshopper forum at the time, and so it's a legacy yeah. forum. Whereas now you have what's called uh, Rhino dot discourse, right? Uh, and and so uh, this one, which is a lot more uh, yeah. user friendly, but it's uh, yeah. But you'll probably as you Google, you'll see and uh, current. Yes, and current exactly. Yes. Um, a question for you from Albert John. Okay. Yeah. Um, he starts off by saying possibly an unfair question, <clears throat> but I don't think it is. I think it's a good it's a good question. Yeah. Um, why learn Grasshopper as opposed to Houdini or Blender procedural workflows? Okay, um, he points out that community would be one reason. Uh, access to plugins is another. You know, I think that access to plugins is huge. I think, uh, you, you know, uh, links to fabrication um, and, you know, analysis tools that any architect or engineer is probably is going to be essential. But are there any other reasons that you would suggest, Arthur, why someone in, yeah. uh, you know, should look at Grasshopper as opposed yeah. to the other tools that are mentioned there? A hundred percent. So, so uh, well, I can speak on, for example, Houdini. I know that Houdini is to do um, sort of more like visual effects and 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 simulations that that have so it's really good for for example you're 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 kind of trying to do uh, you're reproducing a coral and you need some kind of complexity and and that's great for like an animation and so on but it comes to the level where you need to fabricate it and you're like mm -hmm. oh damn how do I extract the, and then because you've modeled it on Houdini you might need to import it into Rhino and Grasshopper. And then the list management to extract things to fabricate it is 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 difficult. Whereas if you do everything within Grasshopper, um, you can deal with your list very early on. Therefore, when you fabricate or you create G code, etc. So that's one aspect. Then there's ov obviously, uh, and uh, I, I'm less familiar with Blender, but <clears throat> what I know is 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 on on Grasshopper, you have access to this thing called Fruit for Rhino. Uh, which is uh, where the community, you talked about the community, so I think you you, you got it right, sorry, food for Rhino. And this has a, a, a kind of really impressive amount of plugins. 
and and for example right now we're simulating lights um on or we're creating we're 3d printing concrete or we're and basically everyone is using a different plugin at the moment so it's almost like one tool but it's many tools all of the all of these are free you know and and rhino is a really really cheap software for what it does i'm always quite impressed that we can we don't really need another software when you do uh, rhino and grasshopper um and so uh, there's something fantastic. It's a really nice balance between something that's private, so it's, it, there are developers doing it, not fully open source, and with a, a community that shares things in a, an open source manner. So it's got the best of both worlds, you know? Because I, I know Blender is quite, is, is free and open source, right? <clears throat> I think so. But, yeah. So, okay. Uh, Albert John says, great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I just see if there's something else here. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just read this out from um, Kunshi. Um, Hi, Arthur. I have a question. I've been trying to study Grasshopper for a while, but I always feel not able to create my own uh, Grasshopper scripts from scratch after the classes or courses that um, that Kunshi has attended. And after a while, it becomes very frustrating. How should people learn Grasshopper so they actually feel comfortable or getting used to Grasshopper during their design, their own design process? Um, well, I guess we're going to say, you know, come to our classes. They're different <laughs> to the other classes you're going to experience. As we said, they're delivered live. So you get to talk to human beings and expert human beings that have an interest in helping you. Uh, move forward you know it's not a series of lectures and then you have access to the recordings as well um, uh, you know I, I I think Arthur is one of the very best instructors of grasshopper that you will come across um, so um, you know, I, I recommend that but Arthur is there anything else you'd like to say well thank you Paul well, first of all for the kind comment and then it's just like um, I think a lot of the classes don't take their time. And a lot of the classes are trying to cram a predefined set of files so that they, they basically they're, they're, they just have like a curriculum and then go for it and blindly sort of continue to teach you no matter what, if you understand. I will never do that. And my, my, my colleagues will never do that. Basically, we'll do it until you get it. And, and that's really important because Otherwise, there's no point in building complexity. And a lot of people think they actually know Grasshopper, but they don't, uh, in a sense that they don't know what the domain of a curve is. They don't know what um, the, the the T values, the 2D space, the 3D space, the, what's a, the fourth dimension, you name it, you know, what's a Bezier curve, what's a, like, what's, how do you flip a matrix that is not uh, three-dimensional, et cetera. Those are questions I usually ask when we're hiring here. And and people that came in and say, I'm, I'm fluent in Grasshopper five-star, they actually cannot answer the core answers, and and so and so obvious. Of it's it's to me it's obvious if, if starting a, a grasshopper from scratch is understanding grasshopper from scratch with the core principles, the core elements, and that that's what we focus on. Even in level two, we won't go further unless people understand all the core. And I test people as I go. I listen, and then we will always. Um, you know, whoever is struggling the most, that's the level of the class. <laughs> and actually, it's it's still fun for the people that are more advanced because uh, because there are a lot of things that they wouldn't have known, and because they a lot of them are self-taught, and, and so we we go to the core, to the essence. Okay, and of course, keeping the group sizes down to a small group size of eight people really helps with this approach. You can't have big groups of people and take this approach. You know. I also I also give you homework, so you know I can I can check what you're doing, and and th those homework could be your own very projects. So you could present your own work and and get a chance to ask questions live, and and I, I think that that helps a lot. Yes, so be prepared for some homework, people. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. There's no grading system, so you know. No yes, pressure, yes. but it helps. It helps to do your own thing because otherwise, it's sort of we say in French, it comes in one ear and leaves to the other ear. <laughs> yes, that's uh, we say that in English too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions that you can see, Steph, that we should? Uh, uh, Nicholas has just asked. Um, 
is there only one group of eight people for each state level? Yeah, so each group, yeah, um, back to that is eight people um, for each date. And then we re we then set out a new set, set of dates yeah. afterwards. So once, so once that one date is full, then we do um, yeah. another one. I should also point out at this point, it's probably quite useful to say here that obviously we have the schedule courses, but also, you know, for companies or people that need something very bespoke, Mm -hmm. um, or project based that's perhaps more private, um, then obviously we can teach that as well. We can um, organize bespoke private grasshopper training um, and deliver that um, online, in person if applicable. Um, all these things are available. So we'd encourage you that if that's something that, you know, if you don't want to come to a class or you have a company or project that, you know, you want to keep separate then obviously we can arrange um, separate individual um, grasshopper tuition also with Arthur and his team. That is also something that we do. Um, yes, so that's tailored and project specific grasshopper tuition. Uh, and that's yes, yeah. Steph yeah. is describing there. I just want to make sure that's clear for Nicholas as well. Yes, it's one date, but it spreads over ses seven sessions. So it starts on a single date. There's seven sessions, each lasting three hours I believe uh, and each session is live but recorded okay so you attend seven sessions starting on the date listed on our website under the level one or the level two class so I hope that answers your question um, okay is there anything else I just had one uh, question more about the uh, experience on your wedding um, uh, how, how uh, from Francis how soon after getting married did you burn down the temple? And uh, just a comment is that that's a very rare experience, which uh, I must agree with. Yes, extremely rare. <laughs> and what did that feel like? I mean, uh, that's a question from me. Uh, amazing. Well, I promised the guests and my wife weren't inside. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was um, incredible. I, I think generally, you know. Um, like when you build a project, you're sometimes quite disassociated with it. You know, you, you know, I'm sure you feel that where you're given tasks and you're building something, but you know, you can't connect what it is you're doing with your personal life or your personal convictions and your, and 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 having the ability to find a purposeful or meaningful creativity is is a great, incredible feeling. And and when we worked on that project, it was so intense. Like I'm sure Paul remember seeing me well stressed. We had to fundraise. We had to uh, uh, we had a team of 140 people to uh, across the globe. Like and and so by the time we finished, like, I was like, wow, we actually managed to do it. And my wife has been so encouraging, so so amazing along the whole process. She helped me throughout the whole thing. And I just thought like let's turn this sort of re relatively painful experience into a really positive experience. And, and and so the wedding was one way to also, um, I, I don't want to say take ownership together of that project, but to like almost kind of experience it in in such a integral part of my life. And 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 that was incredible. And then we burned it together. And and of course, you know, it's not good to to burn buildings. This is this <laughs> just caveat. Don't do it at home. But it, it's just like there is a ritual at Burning Man where people put very, very personal thing in the temple, including ashes of deceased relative and so on. And so it's a very deep thing. When, when we burn it, everyone is crying and so on. And, and so there was this sense of letting go, of moving on, of moving to the next adventure. Of I was personally quite reassured because, you know, I didn't want it to collapse on anyone. And it's, it's you know, I sort of show you the engineering and, and, and that we relied a lot on all the kind of uh, uh, parametric engineering that, that was kind of pushing all boundaries possible. So, so, you know, for it to finish and be safe and everyone enjoyed it, I was just quite happy to move on, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Arthur. Um, there is there's one final question here, but it's quite a sort of very specific grasshopper use type question. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to just um, is there anything else, Steph, more general questions before? Because otherwise I'll finish on this very this specific uh, 
yeah. Kind of no, more the only other thing I wanted to say, the only other thing I wanted to say was um, I did have a slide, but we have a slight tech issue on that. Um, so, if you want to go on with your question, all I wanted to say towards the end was um, thank you to everybody for joining us, um, and just to point out that we do regular. Uh, Rhino UK user group meetings and Grasshopper user group meetings and all these things we send out in our newsletters and we mention them on our social, social Simply Rhino social media channels. So I would encourage people to find us on Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook, LinkedIn um, at Simply Rhino. That's how you'll find us. So please contact us on there. Go to the um, simplyrhino.co.uk website and you can sign up to our newsletters. Um, which we only send out once a month, um, but it's got loads of um, info and offers in it. Um, so uh, have a sign up to those. Um, and next week, we actually have our next uh, Rhino UK Youth Group meeting. Um, and that's on October the 6th. It's next um, Wednesday. Um, and it's uh, a meeting with um, Michael Eden, who's a um, ceramic artist and maker. Um, he will be presenting his work and showing us how he um, use it, incorporates Rhino um, into his work. So that meeting is there. Um, you can find it on the Simply Rhino website. If you go to our, any of our calendars, either our training calendar or our events calendar, you'll see it on there. You can see a link to it. And it's also on our uh, rhino3d.co.uk website where you can see all our events and videos and stuff. So I'd encourage people to look on there. And of course, I forgot YouTube. We're on YouTube. We have loads of um, brilliant free uh, video material, which I would encourage people to have a look at on there. You'll find some excellent material. And that's all I yeah. have to say. Yeah, and all those um, previous Rhino user group meetings, the online versions anyway, are all there. Yeah. There's an archive of them all. So you can go and see people like Heatherwick Studios and, and, and many others um, presenting their user case you know, uh, stories on how they use Rhino and Grasshopper in practice. So um, there's a lot to be learned from from some of those uh, leading uh, practices. Um, OK, so this last question for you, Arthur, um, and this kind of puts you on the spot a little bit. How uh, from NEO, how can you manage your Grasshopper plugin library well? OK, for uh, me, th the bar where the plugins are located is completely overloaded. Does that question make sense for you? And is there any suggestions that you would have? I know this is a little um, sort of a detailed question about grass. No, 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 it's great. Uh, do you, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I was I was just trying to kind of have fun showing you like when you can apply something to one curve, you can apply it to many curves. In in a sense, what you're doing is is like a tool. So your tool is. It creates a module to some extent. So design-wise, your module is also. Anyways, um, Control Alt Left Click. Like this is a way to actually understand where things come from, uh, which is really helpful. I personally do not use icons because I find icons require an added layer of learning. You know, Grasshopper comes like this normally, right? Now. If you were to keep it this way, you'd have to not only know the icon, you'd have to know the, the letter, what it stands for. And so you'd have to know things that you don't really need to know. <laughs> and so the way I want to teach it to you is, is to minimize what it is that you don't really need to learn and focus on what you actually need to learn. So for example, let's say you have some obscure plugin somewhere. You see everything comes through with the right name, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is essential yeah. because when it when it comes to a new plugin, last thing you want is to guess what the icon does and so on. So that's my first kind of trick. Obviously, there's way too many, and I've just chosen the one plugin that's going to collapse. No, that's fine. Good. So uh, there's a ton of plugin, and there's obviously I would never know all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. But but when it comes to actually finding something like Twinkle by having it written, it you know, I, it makes me understand it a lot, lot, lot better than if I were always to, to use my icon. So two tricks, full name, no icon, uh, and then control alt left click, which tells you where it is in all that mess. Yeah, okay. I don't know if that helps at so, all. Any yeah. I hope that does help out with your question. There's but there's I something think... called the, the ribbon as well. Uh, sorry, uh, I just thought about it, but um, there's something that you can uh, 
I, you know, you can actually choose how much to show or not. But I don't know if it if if it's been kept. Uh, I think it's called the ribbon ribbon tab icon. This guy, uh, which might help you a little bit, maybe not, but it makes it a bit shorter. But I think you can also save. Uh, not that I'm doing it because I, I you know, I, it's not something that I needed. But you can actually save different. You can have different modes of display uh, for that. But uh, maybe we'll talk about it in in our in our class. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, anyhow, I hope that helps. Um, and I think Steph, we can finish there. Yeah. So I hope yeah. it's been a uh, useful session for everybody who attended. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you so much, yeah, everyone. Thanks to everybody, and thanks to Arthur. And Thank you. Paul. Thank you so much, Arthur. Good to see you. Good to see you, Paul. Come back. <laughs> I will. I'll see you soon. Ciao, ciao. That's it. All right. Okay, bye, -bye. bye everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.